very warm welcome and good afternoon from Liechtenstein, from the Hilti Foundation. I'm Christine Romberg and I have the pleasure to accompany you through this afternoon. We are very happy to have the opportunity to have uh, underwater archaeologist Frank Godio with us. Good afternoon, Frank. Good afternoon, it's so good to have you here. The Hilti Foundation has been collaborating with Frank Godio for more than 25 years. And the um, remarkable and interesting results which Frank has achieved so far have made it possible to almost write new chapters to the history of ancient Egypt. We are going to dive deeper today into the city of Tonis Herakleion, which was one of the most important cities in Egypt, especially in the later time of uh, the Pharaonic uh, Empire. And it was a city where all pharaohs had to go to receive their universal rights and universal power in the great temple of Amunger. And it was one of the biggest, if not the biggest port in Egypt, doing the trade with the Mediterranean countries. And we see a lot of influence in the next uh, minutes and uh, hours, which we are going to spend with Frank Godio. Frank, it is our real pleasure, and I don't want to take more of your precious time, but I want to invite you, all of you who are listening, who are watching, to write your questions already now in the chat, because we will have some time for question and answer. And now over to you, Frank. Thank you very much, Christine. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, we have been working on the city of Tunis Herakeo since now 25 years. It all started from an ancient text. We knew from various ancient texts that two cities existed once upon a time in Egypt, the city of Herakeo and the city of Tunis. But those two cities had never been discovered. And the challenge was to look for those two cities. Thus, uh, studying all the documents and the account uh, published uh, in ancient time, we uh, defined an area of the Bay of Aboukir in the data of the Nile in Egypt where most probably those city could have existed once upon a time. And we made a survey with sophisticated equipment and 6.5 kilometers away from the present coast of Egypt, we discovered what could be one of those two cities. After 25 years, I can say today that we were looking for two cities. We thought we found one and another one has to be found. As a matter of fact, we discovered, thanks to the artifact found in situ, that there was only one city. Tonis was the Egyptian name of that city, very old Egyptian name, and Herakion was the name of that city given by the Greek coming into that city. And today, you can see after 25 years of work, the layout of the city of Tonis Herakion, which was a kind of a Venice, you know, uh, islands, islets, channels. It was a beautiful city developing over more than two square kilometers. We are continuously working every year on the site of Tunis Herakion. But you would think, oh, uh, it must be easy to discover a city. It is not, because if you dive on the site of Tunis Herakion, you will be surprised to see nothing. Nothing, why? Because every other site is covered by a sandy sediment, it's flat. And furthermore, the visibility in those waters is extremely poor, it's in the range of 30 to 20 centimeters. Thus, we had to develop certain techniques in order to do a follow-up of the work we are doing in Tony Serakio. And one of those latest techniques is what we call stereophotogrammetry. We take 
thousand of pictures very close from each artifact, then we assemble all those thousands of uh, pictures together through uh, visual reconnaissance. And we have sometimes visual which where you can see more than 100 meters of the excavation site. And you see, for example, in that uh, picture, uh, the remains of the temple, of the main temple of the city of Tennis, Heraklion, which collapsed into a channel after an earthquake followed by a tidal wave. We are also developing new techniques uh, and new prototype equipment in order to visualize in 3D what could be buried under the sediment. It's a very, very powerful tool which enable us to have, I would say, fantastic results on this particular site. Let us take an example. Uh, in the center of Tunis Heraklion is the main island when you see the red arrow there. And during the cataclysm, there has been a landslide and most of the main temple of that city of Tunis Heraklion fell into the channel which was running south of the temple. Let us go on this side. We are here south of the temple. You see the channel. And we started an excavation there. And we were surprised to find that when the temple collapsed, the blocks of the temple fell upon a ship, and we found this beautiful shipwreck of a Ptolemaic galley, which sank on the slope of the channel, and which is buried under five meters of hard sediment at the end of that shipwreck. This uh, Ptolemaic uh, galley was the first galley ever found of that type ever. Thus, we went on excavating on that site. And uh, 80 centimeters to 100, uh, to 100 centimeters of sand, we found close to the galley the large limestone blocks of the temple. And uh, the blocks you can find very well preserved ceramics, sometimes well packed, still as they were at the time they fell into the channel. And going down uh, into the channel, you can also discover under the ceramic and under the blocks some very interesting remains of animals. You will say, why some animals there? because in the temple of uh, Tony Serakion there were animal sacrifices. And here you can see uh, bones, and sometimes you are finding very big bones, like uh, bones of hippopotamus, which were sacrificed during the ceremony in that temple. We found and excavated the main temple of Tony Serakion, especially the temple to the supreme god of the uh, Egyptian Pantheon, the god Amon. And in that temple, we found Colossus statue, like this red granite statue of the god Api, god of the flood of the Nile, god which was bringing fertility and abundance to the kingdom of Egypt. Uh, that statue is weighing eight tons. It's made of red granite. It's the highest and biggest statue of god ever found in Egypt. But we found also secondary sanctuaries uh, with some statuette of God and goddess. But we can go even further deep into the religious life of that period by finding the ritual instruments which were used for several specific rituals such the one of the mysteries of Rosaris, 
which was a very secret ritual which was held in the temple of Amongered in the city of Sunny Heraklion. And finding the ritual instrument, we can reconstruct, we can recreate what was the religious life in those sanctuaries. But sometimes we have also during excavation, a very nice surprise. It happened uh, this year, excavating on the site of Tunis Heraklion, last mission, we found a very beautiful artifact. And those artifacts were used during the ceremony of the mysteries of Osiris. Uh, those gold and silver dish have been used uh, before between the 5th and the 2nd century BC in that temple. You have to understand that silver was even more valuable than gold for ancient Egypt. Of course, such a type of artifact will never be found on land because they would have been looted for centuries. But there, we are extremely lucky because the city disappeared in a fraction of a second and everything is frozen in time and has been protected. That city was very important for the pharaoh of that time. And he, the city received a lot of donation of those pharaohs. And we found statues of those pharaohs, colossal statues, which are now in the Museum of Cairo, which we soon open. The city was extremely rich. It benefited from donations from the pharaoh, but also from a very active and profitable trade between Egypt and the Greek world. And that city was the main port of Egypt until the time when Alexander the Great came to Egypt and founded in 3032 BC the city of Alexandria. At that time, he ordered that the trade of Tony Serakion be transferred to the new city of Alexandria. But Tony Serakion maintained a great importance for the pharaoh because it was the city owning, having the temple to the simpering god Amon. And all pharaoh of those times had to come to this main temple of Tony Serakeion in order to receive from the Supreme God Amon their title as universal king. You see here on that picture few of the treasure that we uh, find in Tony Serakeion, gold coins, jewelry. It's absolutely very extraordinary for the richness of the time. That city was uh, posted at the mouth of the main branch of the Nile, which was called the Canopic branch. It was the widest and the deepest branch of the Nile, the most navigable one. So it was a port of entry to Egypt. And that port of entry had to be defended. For that, there was a garnison in Tunis Erakeon. But furthermore, we know from the text that the pharaoh had Greek mercenary. And uh, the text is talking about mercenary. But we bring artifacts which prove that the text are right. We, uh, you can see on that picture, uh, Greek helmet, uh, Greek javelin, etc. So sometimes the texts are helping us to discover artifacts and to know the history of the city. But the excavation, we feed and explain the text uh, very often. And there is a kind of uh, speech between the text and the archaeological work. Uh, in Tunis Erakion. Is 
there was the trade, there was the army, but of course, in Tunis Erachillon, there were inhabitants there living. And we are finding thousands of artifacts which illustrate, help us to understand the daily life in Tunis Erachillon. On land, you will find broken ceramic shards. Here, on that picture, you can see that we are finding them very often perfectly intact. It's a kind of a unique site only for on this aspect. In Tunis Herakleon, we are finding also important messages from the past when we discover inscribed monuments like this still dating back from 380 BC, which tell us that in the first year of the reign of Pharaoh Nectanebo, 380 BC, the Pharaoh came to the city of Tunis Herakleon and ordered that all ship in coming into Egypt had to go through the port of Tony Serakio. And all ship had to pay taxes and duty, duty on imported goods, whether raw material or manufactured goods, whether they enter or they, or they were exported from Egypt. Tony Serakio was a very important port the biggest port of Egypt. Thus, you can expect that there was a lot of traffic. As a matter of fact, at that date, we found more than 750 ancient anchors in the port basin of Heraclion. And we found also shipwrecks. We count, at today, at present day, 79 ancient shipwrecks dating back from the 6th to the 2nd century BC. Every year, we are discovering new shipwrecks. For example, last mission, and the two known shipwrecks, we found two other shipwrecks, and uh, of course, we start to excavate them, and when we find a shipwreck, we identify it, we take a wood sample, and we decide whether to excavate on it, and if we excavate it, we do naval architectural studies, and we study that shipwreck thoroughly. What is amazing between the relation between the ancient text and also archaeological result, uh, has been perfectly illustrated in this case. We knew from an ancient text that Herodotus, the father of history, the first great historian in the world, in the fifth century BC, came to Egypt. And he say he landed in Egypt in the city of Heraclion. And he is describing the temple, saying that the temple of Tunis, Heraclion, were extremely old temple, very big, that Aena and Paris, of, uh, uh, when they went to Troia, stopped there, that King Menelaus came into the same place. And he said, it's a big port. And in that port, I see boats which are very peculiar. They, I call them Bari, and they are built in such a way, and he's describing how those ships are built. When you read the text, many naval architecture experts say <laughs> Herodotus must have made a big mistake. You cannot build a boat like that. A boat like that will never float, etc. Impossible. We excavated one of the 79 boats of Tony Serakion, and we came across 
about called Bari as described by Herodotus, and we could prove that it has been did exactly as described in detail by Herodotus. Thus, sometimes the excavation confirm ancient texts, people were doubting about them. It was a port, and uh, when you say a port, you can say imported goods and uh, trade. As a matter of fact, in Tunis Heraclion, you will find merchandise, I would say, proceeding from all over the Mediterranean world, from the Greek world, from Phoenicia, from Rhodes, from Cyprus, and a, a lot of type of different type of ceramic, sometimes very coarse ceramic, sometimes very luxury uh, uh, items. And the way this trade was unbelievable and the uh, trading exchange were extremely active in Tunis Heraclion. Tunis Heraclion was the meeting point of two great civilizations. As the pharaoh decided that it was the obligatory port of entrance to Egypt for all boats coming from the Greek world, it was the meeting point of the Greek civilization with the, the Egyptian very old civilization. And from that encounter was created new artistic uh, artifact, uh, a new culture developed, new art developed, and in the region, new god appeared, which were uh, a kind of a mixture of Egyptian and Greek gods. But even the political power changed, and in at the end of the fourth century, in 332, Alexander the Great came to Egypt, became pharaoh in Egypt, and his follower, General Ptolemy, founded a new dynasty, the Ptolemaic dynasty, which lasted 300 years and ended with the death of Cleopatra VII. And it all started in Tunis Heraclion. Alexander the Great came through Tunis Heraclion also before founding the city of Alexandria. Imported goods, sometimes very luxury good, like uh, this uh, perfume container made of bronze under the shape of a, a duck that we found this year, a very beautiful artifact bath also master's piece of art. We have discovered in Tunis Heraclion, for example, this bronze sculpture, and the specialist claim that that bronze sculpture of a naked woman powering some liquid has been created by one of the most fa famous artists in the world, living in the fourth century BC in Greece, Praxiteles himself. And most of the statue and the production of pra Praxiteles is known only from representation on coins or copy of the original, which were done in the first century BC, first century AD, and second century AD by the Roman, and the copy were found during archaeological excavation in Rome. But they are only copy of those uh, uh, masterpiece. The uh, foreigners living in Tunis Heraclion, of course, had their own region, and Pharaoh allowed them to have their own temple and sanctuary, such as this one, which was a Greek uh, sanctuary. 
And in those sanctuary, we are also discovering the god and goddesses that they were worshipping, as you can see here, Isis and Dionysos, or Aphrodite and Dionysus. We have now a very good image and view of what could look the city of Tonis Herakleion in the 4th century BC. This is not an artist's rendering, but it's done on the basis of our topography in Tonis Herakleion. Tonis Herakleion was at that time one of the most important city of Egypt. It had a very important religious power thanks to the temple of Amon. It was the largest port on the Mediterranean seashore. It was the biggest port of Egypt. And it was also the guarding post of Egypt, guarding, according to Herodotus, the entrance to Egypt. And Tonis Herakleion, unfortunately, around 140 BC has been struck by an earthquake which triggered a tidal wave which itself triggered land liquefaction phenomena and in a fraction of a second the city sank more than 6.5 meters deep. And as it was at the border of the Mediterranean Sea, at sea level, of course, the sea came, covered the entire city, destroyed the entire city, and then, over centuries, silt sealed totally the remains of Tonis Herakleion. Maritime sand came over the silt and have totally hidden that city for more than a thousand years. And uh, working there since 25 years, we could say, oh, you have done a lot. We have not done a lot. And we think that we have done maximum 5% of the work on that site. We are just paving the way for future generation of researchers. All this work is a work of a team. That team is supported by ET Foundation since the very beginning of the discovery. And uh, it's a dedicated, dedicated team, uh, international team made of specialists of uh, any kind, uh, specialists in uh, technology, in ceramic, in coins, in excavation, in history, in naval architecture, restorer, cameraman, photographer, uh, people uh, uh, skilled in drawing uh, archaeological uh, report, etc. And uh, every year that team is gathering and it's working two months on the site of Tonis Herakleion. And every year we think that that year will not be as good as the last year. But every year, we are surprised and we do think that we have achieved even better results than the year before, because the site uh, wants that. And the last artifact we found this year is a very uh, strange artifact. It's a souvenir from Herakleion, and it's written from Herakleion, if you visit Paris, you will buy an Eiffel Tower. The tourist visiting Herakleion in the second century BC would have bought a small bowl uh, with souvenir from Herakleion. Of course, all those artifacts have been restored, preserved, studied, but we want also that the grand public had access to those artifacts. This is why we are also organizing international exhibition tour. And the next tour will be 
about the encounter of those two great civilizations, classical Greek civilization and the everlasting Egyptian civilization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for this inspiring presentation and for sharing with us your latest discoveries. I'm very happy to say that we have a very international audience this afternoon. And I would uh, like to start right with the first question, which we received from Liam, who is a diver colleague of yours, it seems. And she said, um, what uh, is the average depth of this area in which you are working today? And what is the usual visibility? We are working in Abu Kirbe. Uh, it's not deep at all. We are in a depth between, I would say, 15 meters to 8 8.5 meters of water, but knowing that the artifacts are, are not on the bottom of the sea, they are lying under the sediment, all thick of sediment. Some artifacts lie under 1.2, 1 meter of sediment, sandy sediment, but other artifacts are deep buried under the clay. And for example, the Ptolemaic galley that we have uncovered go as much as 5.2 meters deep under the clay plus one meter of sand, meaning six meters of sediment. The visibility in those water is skimpy. Let us say, when we have 30 centimeter visibility, we cannot complain but sometimes the visibility is nearly zero. This is why we are developing those techniques of stereophotogrammetry. We take thousands of pictures of the site before excavating it, during its, each excavation, and we can follow up in 3D the whole rendering of the excavation like if there were no water. Uh, we have one question that uh, ideally follows the one you just answered. Uh, and part of your extreme success, especially over the past years, has been the ongoing interest and your curiosity in the technical part of excavating and especially of preparing and doing the sounding uh, of the area. And there is one question that asks, uh, how did the subsurface geophysic detection change your, very your way of working in these bad diving conditions? I would say that uh, it changed tremendously the way and uh, I think we paved like uh, this a new way for future archaeological excavation underwater. Our philosophy is that please don't touch. <laughs> the more you touch, the more you excavate, the more you destroy. So let us have the maximum of information before excavating. I always compare this a little bit like surgery in the 19th century, okay? <laughs> they were opening, looking what was happening in your body and trying to repair here and there. Nowadays, you do scanner, you do echography, you do many things, and you, the, the surgeon goes exactly at a millimeter where it should go to uh, cure uh, and repair. We are doing exactly the same. Uh, we will not open a site like that. We will do sp uh, punctual, very specific, I, I would say, surgery excavation in order to, to touch as less as possible the site and having as much as information as possible. That's a, a very nice comparison, actually. It's, and it's completely clear that and corresponds 100% to, to the two sciences, no? medicine on one hand and archaeology on the, on the other. Uh, there is a question about Egypt. Uh, what uh, is the Egypt's or Egypt's government's point of view uh, of your amazing finds? What do they think about the work? Oh. How do they see it? How do they well, judge it? We are not uh, working by ourselves. Uh, it's a joint team. It's a team from the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquity and uh, our team. And uh, the Ministry, uh, Egyptian Ministry, and the General Secretary of Antiquity have their own archaeologists on board with whom we are working. It's absolutely a joint team. 
in that team, uh, you have many, many nationalities. I counted 11 of those, Egyptian, French, German, Spanish, Cuban, Philippine, Russian, uh, American, and uh, Belgium, and most of the Spanish. And I am still uh, looking for the missing one. Thus, we have a, it's a really an international team which gather every year, and we are living together above the site full time during two months on board Princess Buddha, uh, which is our support vessel. And we are working together, and uh, the uh, exhibition we are doing are joint exhibition because all the object being the property of Egypt, Egypt allows us to organize traveling exhibition, but they are joint exhibition with the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquity of, of Egypt and ourselves. Frank, you have mentioned and answered the following question uh, already, but nevertheless, I would like to repeat it. What percent of the site do you estimate uh, you have completed the excavation so far? I think it's, very good, it's a very good question. Ten years ago, I thought we had excavated five to ten percent. Today, I would say we have excavated not more than three percent because developing the new techniques, uh, we can see that there is much more than what we thought buried under the sediment. And the more we are working, the more we understand that we are not far at all, and we have many decades, if not century, of work ahead of the teams which we work on those sites. You spoke about future generations of, of archaeologists and about also sharing your technical development with uh, your colleagues uh, internationally. Um, of course, we always want to share our results and your results with the public. So the next question from Jim is about where these wonderful artifacts can be seen. Do they, will they be in Alessandria, in Alexandria, or in, uh, in Cairo Museum? Yes, we are working on uh, several sites uh, in Egypt. Uh, the in Alexandria, the Portus Magnus, in Tonicera Keion, and cannot is in the Bay of Abukir. Uh, in 25 years, we have uh, a database of 39,000 objects, which has been brought on land not mentioning the tens of thousands which has, have been uh, decided to stay under water because we, for each artifact, we decide with the Egyptian authority whether we should bring it or let it under water in situ because this is very important. And those 39,000 artifacts, of course, the most important one uh, on the historical point of view, or the most beautiful one, or the most, uh, I would say, uh, extraordinary ones, uh, are now exhibited in uh, Egyptian Museum, in Alexandria, in Cairo. For example, the big Colossus statue you have seen at the presentation will be uh, exhibited in the GEM, the Grand Egyptian Museum, in Cairo, which is one, uh, if not the biggest museum in the world, which uh, soon opens. And uh, the other are in the National Museum of Alexandria, in the Marita Museum. But of course, we have also very humble object, which could be very important on the scientific point of view. Sometimes a shard is more important than a beautiful statue. Uh, but those objects, in order to be studied, in order to be published, are um, stored in the Marita Museum of Alexandria. And uh, there, the scientists can come, photograph them, study them, and publish them. And about the most significant object or recovery you have done so far is the next question. What is for you the most significant find so far? It's very <laughs> difficult to say <laughs> because you can, uh, this question can uh, be applied on the aesthetic point of view or on the historical point of view. Uh, I would say on the historical point of view, uh, we found, I cannot choose one, but I could at least choose two. 
a intact steel that you have seen in that picture made of uh, black granite, perfectly intact, which is extremely rare, a two meter high, which explains that Pharaoh came in the antiquities, that he ordered uh, a lot of things which has been applied for centuries. This, this is a steel of Denis Heraclion. And I would say an extraordinary monument also, uh, which is called the Naos of the Decade, which has an unbelievable history, which was known uh, before even we found it. <laughs> and uh, by text, through text, and which is the first calendar of the world. <laughs> uh, it's a fantastic piece. I, I would add to that also another monument of Tony Serakion that we found in the temple of Tony Serakion, which is the Naos, so the saint of the saints of the temple, uh, which hopefully for us was inscribed with hieroglyph and uh, which informs us that he is a house of the supreme god Amon, and that all new pharaoh had to come in front of this monument, open the two doors, see the statue of the supreme god which was inside this monument, and at that time, the supreme god was giving to the new pharaoh the title of his universal power. And of course, this is a uh, fantastic. But on the aesthetic point of view, <laughs> we have most probably an original statue from Praxiteles made of bronze. And we have also an incredible statue of Queen Arsinoe represented as Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love coming out of the water, dressed in a transparent and one tunic. It's one of the most beautiful statues in the world, and it's older <laughs> than the Venice of Milo, and it's made of daggerite, which is the hardest stone we can think of. Hearing you talk about all these artifacts, I just would uh, want to recommend to our audience to also go on the website of Franck Audio, where you can see a lot of uh, pictures uh, from these uh, finds and from other artifacts. Uh, the next two questions lead us back a little bit into the technical side. Uh, have you ever experienced problems by having to interrupt the excavation and then come back next year, then everything is covered with mud again? Did you ever miss out on objects you saw the year before and didn't find again? Is that a problem for you? Uh, first, I, I have to say that when we are doing excavation, before leaving the site, we cover again the site by sediment, with the sediment. It means that, for example, when you excavate a shipwreck, okay, you are doing a trench, uh, a very big hole. Before leaving the site, you will feel totally that all we sink and sand in order to protect the artifact. And uh, the only thing which interrupt could interrupt a mission is weather. <laughs> uh, of course, if uh, uh, a, a bad storm is coming, it, it has happened. It had happened that we have to stop two, maximum three days. But we are back on the site very soon, and uh, we finish the work. And when we are excavating, we are positioning each artifact with an accuracy of one centimeter. Thus, even if we cover them with meter of sediment, we can come back 10 years after, and we know exactly where is this artifact and you just have to excavate exactly where it is. <laughs> so you were talking about uh, visibility being a challenge, uh, the, the general situation in the Bay of Abu Kir, um, but there is one question by Marco who asks, what is the biggest challenge you have faced and how did you overcome it? I think the bi biggest challenge, at the beginning of course, <laughs> uh, you are looking for a sunken city. First, a lot of people will say, oh, oh, are you not going to far dig a fish there? <laughs> Thus, you have to survey in order to find that city. The first week you survey, everybody is enthusiastic. One week, perfect. One month, oh, 
two months, three months, uh, Frank, uh, are you sure? Uh, uh, six months, uh, Frank, uh, don't you think we should go uh, <laughs> further? Uh, one year, and when you find it after one year and a half, the biggest challenge, I will say, is to be convinced that you didn't goof when you study the text before defining an area of research. Uh, this is uh, my challenge. Then, for the team, the biggest challenge when we are excavating the site is visibility. Because when you dive and you don't see even your end, uh, it's quite difficult. But now, we are overcoming uh, that challenge by the fact that we have 3D representation of the site, exactly the site where the diver will go before he dives. Thus, he has an image of what should be in front of him, <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he knows exactly that, for example, nearby that uh, glass of water, there will be this element, and that he has to excavate this element and bring it back to the boat in order to be studied and preserved. Um, we talked about the biggest challenge. There is another question. Uh, if there is a special artifact or something special that you have been looking for but haven't found yet? We are not looking for specific artifact because we just don't know what we have to discover. <laughs> uh, we are in a city. We know in that city that there is sanctuary, palaces, port, most probably the port shipwreck. Yes, we found the shipwreck. Most probably uh, uh, stone anchor. Yes, 750. But for example, when you discover a bronze statue, you were not expecting that such a beautiful statue will be there. And uh, I think it's a scientific team. We, we are not looking for, we are fronting facts, we are excavating, and we have to study what we found during the excavation. Uh, and that's it, and publish them, and to get the most, uh, the substance of each artifact that we are finding. But we will uh, not say, ah, I want to find a gold coin, or I want to find a bronze statue. No, you, uh, you have a program, you work according to the program, and if you are lucky, which we were, it gives some good results. So we have a colleague in Egypt following our talk, and um, there are three questions in that uh, chat. We have heard that it was in 140 when uh, this earthquake and tidal wave happened that destroyed Tony Serakion. But the question is, how old do you think was Tony Serakion? Second question, have there been different civilizations? who lived there, and of course, when you talk about a, a sunken city, the question is very quickly coming up, could it be uh, Atlantis? Well, uh, how old is the city? Up to date, the oldest artifact we found dates back from the end of the 7th century BC which doesn't mean that it should not be older because, and this is very striking in Tony Serakeon, uh, from north to south, you are excavating different period of time. Obviously, the north part of the city has been abandoned for reasons we could not understand and the temple has been rebuilt down south. Thus, it could be that we have, n we have not yet excavated some area which could give much older artifacts that we have been finding up to now. Thus, today, end of seven. But I expect that one day we could find much older artifacts than this. Of course, w we found other artifacts, because we found a, a big granite block with cartouche of Ramses II, uh, we have something 
which uh, new empire there it's very has been it has been brought maybe from uh, uh, other temple uh, during the life of Tony Serakeon when Tony Serakeon was still there maybe maybe not uh, we cannot answer to that huh? uh, but I it's an excellent question uh, we should not uh, I think uh, look for something older but most probably one day we will come across uh, that thing. Uh, the other question about uh, different civilization, uh, different civilization uh, maybe I could say uh, yes <laughs> because what has happened after the disaster of 100, around 140 BC the city has been abandoned from nearly 800 years because most of, of it was underwater. But there were some part of islands which were still submerging like islets like that. And it so happened that 800 years before, after the disaster, the Byzantine, pe Byzantine people settled there and uh, on one small islet, which was, as a matter of fact, the summit of the main island where was the temple of Amongereb, <laughs> they built a small convent of nuns, and we found there uh, artifacts uh, with uh, coins, gold coins, from the Byzantine period and even the Islamic period. And in the 8th century AD, a new cataclysm occurred, which totally sank forever for more than eight, uh, 1,200 uh, years, the site. To uh, get to this point where you say, I think this, this city has been submerged, the city must have been there, etc. There was a lot of study going be going on before that, before you decided to, to do the first mission. We have one question from a colleague who said uh, he or she had the possibility to visit the Bibliotheca Alexandrina recently and saw a lot of maps uh, before and uh, during uh, the, um, the stay there. And he, she or he asks, did you and your team study these maps before you were uh, starting the excavation? And up to which extent have you found uh, that they correspond to each other, the reality which you excavated? Unfortunately, all those maps date back from much after uh, the 8th uh, century. So much Edith. younger than much when you longer, excavated. Much longer. Thus, of course, I look at map, etc., but there is no map uh, existing. Of course, you have map of the Bay of Abukir, uh, in the uh, 17th century, a lot in the 18th century, many, many of the 19th century, especially that uh, the Battle of the Night took uh, place uh, nearby the city of Heraclion, but above water. And, uh, but none of those maps could be of some help because they were much later. A colleague from China is uh, with us and uh, he would simply like to take the opportunity to pay tribute to your work, congratulations. And uh, of course there is a question if there is any chance to visit the archeological site at all. Yeah. This, uh, we have two sites in Alexandria. One in the main port of, uh, ancient main port of Alexandria, the Portus Magnus, and one in Tony Serakeon in the Bay of Abuki. The one of Tony Serakeon is nearly seven kilometers away from the present coast of Egypt. That's, uh, and visibility zero, and everything is totally buried uh, under the sediment. Because even when we uncover something and we let it in situ, before leaving, we cover it again with the sediment. Just somebody going on the site of Tony Serakeon will see nothing and uh, you cannot build uh, an underwater museum seven kilometers away from the coast. It's a different game in Alexandria. In Alexandria, we have found very 
historically important remains nearby the coast of the city of Alexandria. And uh, the authorities had with UNESCO an idea of one day uh, creating an underwater museum where people could uh, walk on tunnel and go on specifically very important sites still existing because with the Egyptian authority, very often we decide to let artifacts in situ underwater hoping that one day such a museum could be created. Thus, you have to wait a little bit of years, <laughs> but maybe one day it could be possible. But of course, uh, you can see those artifacts in the Egyptian Museum. And we are also organizing traveling exhibition, and uh, which could go, why not, to China and elsewhere in the world, and uh, where we are presenting all those beautiful artifacts, once they have been studied, restored, explained, and it's the best moment, I would say, because there is two beautiful moments. The, the instant you are discovering the artifact underwater, then you bring that artifact at the surface and it's losing a lot of its magic, you know, because it's not underwater, you start to clean it, to restore it, to put it in several baths, etc. Then it goes to the warehouse with not very beautiful light, it's studied, etc. Then, years after, you bring that artifact together with other artifacts which were close to it in the antiquity because they were all there together, explaining each other, completing each other. And you present this to the public with the light, with the explanation, and uh, with the movies, and it's the second time those objects bring magic to the public. I think, Frank, that's a, a perfect closure of this, uh, this uh, afternoon. We are almost uh, filling our 60 minutes. Thank you very, very much for this. Thank you for the outlook into the future. We look forward to more exhibitions. We look forward especially also to more publications in collaboration with our Institute for Underwater Archaeology in Oxford, with our colleagues. And as we have heard today, there is a lot more to do. 3% of uh, the entire region have been excavated, so a lot of work uh, being ahead. Thank you for being with us. Thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon and follow us on the Hilti Foundation website, on the Frank Bodio website of the EA EAASM, yeah. of this institute. And we look forward to sharing more news and more interesting results soon in the future. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Thank you.